as usual, um, our wonderful uh, funders, the Department of Child Services, and also the Kids First Trust Fund. Uh, you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to do these these programs free of charge, and and they're just a wonderful support. So as usual, we we want to want to thank them. Uh, as we go through, if you could put any questions that you have in the the chat. Um, some of them we may be able to get with, you know, during the, the presentation, but um, we'll, we'll definitely try to, to get them uh, at the end. So, uh, you know, feel free to, to still do that within the chat so you don't forget. Um, so I guess it is my huge honor to introduce our speaker. And uh, Dr. Marla Broussard is a professor emerita in the School of Psychology program at Teachers College, Columbia University. And for 40 years, her research has focused on psychological maltreatment of children by, you know, all caregivers, parents, teachers, peers. Uh, she's co-authored four books, many articles and chapters on psychological maltreatment. She co-convened the first international conference on psychological logical uh, abuse in 1983, co-authored the American Profession Society on Child Abuse Endorsed Definition of Psychological Maltreatment, co-wrote the ABSAC Guidelines for the Psychological Evaluation of Suspected Psychological Maltreatment, co-convened the International Child Psychological Maltreatment Summit in 2019, uh, in which we were very honored to, to play a part. And now she spends much of her time doing research and professional trainings with the Psychological Maltreatment Alliance. Uh, her current research is on interventions to improve professional skills in confronting poor parenting and psychological maltreatment in child welfare, health, and early education settings. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and past president of the Council of Directors of School Psychology Programs. So again, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Marla Broussard. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'll move to sharing my screen. Um, share. Okay. Does everyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. We'll start. Okay, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm really honored to speak to all of you today. I am so appreciative of all the work you do on behalf of children and families. And I'm very proud to be part of the community that works to protect children and to support parents in the very difficult job of parenting. So Sandy gave me a great introduction. Um, if you wanna reach out to me, please, please feel free. So the training I'm presenting today was developed with the Psychological Maltreatment Alliance, which is the Fontana Center, um, me, Stuart Hart, and the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. And we've developed a number of materials that are on our website that you're welcome to use as long as you acknowledge that you used, uh, got the material from us. Um, there's a lot of things there that may be useful to you in your line of work. I wanna begin talking about psychological maltreatment by pointing out that it comes, it's used, a lot of different names are used for it. So it's called, some people call it emotional harm, mental injury, um, emotional abuse, emotional neglect. We just happen to prefer the term psychological because it encompasses emotion, distortions in thinking, in motivations, in values, et cetera. And then maltreatment, just covers both abuse and neglect. We think that it deserves more attention than it's getting because it's the most widespread of all types of violence against children, not just in the US, but around the world. It exists all by itself, but it very frequently co-occurs with all other forms of child maltreatment. It's very hard to hit a kid without yelling at them. And even if you just hit a child, that message of not caring, of anger, of being demeaned and humiliated comes through, even if words aren't used. And we know now from a huge body of international research that it has a very negative impact on child development. 
here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about. I'm gonna first start by talking about the different forms and types of psychological maltreatment because you can't address something if you don't know what it is. I'll then talk about risk and protective factors because these are really important for treatment planning. And I imagine this is something um, that in your line of work you're very familiar with, but I'll just review those. Very briefly talk about how common it is and then uh, provide some information about how harmful it is in ways that are sometimes very surprising. But just identifying and maybe reporting suspected psychological maltreatment is a very small part of what we wanna be able to do. Um, what's really important is to have skills that if you work regularly with children and you observe them interacting with their parents, you want to be able to intervene in a positive way when you observe poor parenting that might or might not be psychological maltreatment. And then all of us, I think, can do a better job to change the social environments we're in to prevent psychological maltreatment and promote respect for anybody. So I have some su suggestions there of things that can be done to improve the immediate environment in which you're working. So let's start with forms and types. So there was an interest in non-physical, non-sexual forms of maltreatment as early as the 1970s when the US federal government passed the Child Abuse and Treatment Act. And in that act, they included emotional harm as one of the forms of abuse and neglect. However, they left it up to each state to define their own form. And this was true for physical abuse, sexual abuse, et cetera. So, Indiana, like these other states, has its own definition. And they, like most states, uh, originally didn't, in the original laws, didn't define the um, behaviors that parents engaged in that were harmful, but had the form physical or mental harm as an outcome of abuse or neglect. Recently, uh, Robert Henke of the um, uh, Attorney General's office was involved in modifying the state regulations and they defined emotional injury. So it occurs when there's an observable, identifiable um, impairment of a child's mental um, or psychological ability to function as a result of caregiver acts or omissions. So they included here implied or overt threats of death or serious injury, threats of pet or animal torture, constant denigration, and then failure to act. Included in that would be emotional or physical isolation, confinement, or a severe lack of engagement or stimulation. These are things that we would consider, uh, most people would consider emotional neglect. Okay. So the definition that we're presenting today is one um, that was endorsed by the American Professional Society on Abuse and Neglect. And it's based on extensive ongoing research that identifies forms of parenting that are harmful to children. So here it's a repeated pattern or extreme incident of caretaker behavior that supports the child's psychological and developmental needs and conveys that the child is worthless, defective, damaged, unloved, unwanted, endangered, or primarily useful in meeting another's needs and or expendable. This definition overlaps with a number of others, well-tested uh, definitions, and we're involved in an effort to combine all of these definitions um, in one that hopefully could be used nationally and internationally. Okay, why is this not, there we go. All right, there are six types of psychological maltreatment that have been identified in research. One is burning, terrorizing, isolating, exploiting, corrupting, denying emotional responsiveness. You can think here, emotional neglect and medical, mental health and educational neglect. So spurning is verbal and nonverbal caregiver acts that reject and degrade a child. 
And here are a number of them. Cruel nicknames, saying I hate you, looking disgusted, making fun of a child for normal feelings, treating one child significantly worse than siblings, and denigrating those the child loves. Here's a photo of a child placed in a garbage can with a sign nearby saying, put your ugly children here. Some parents demean a child or play pranks in the name of having fun, but children internalize the negative message and don't see this as a joke, even if it's supposed to be one. One form of this that has emerged recently is the shaming of children online by posting humiliating and shameful pictures or videos by their parents, either as a form of punishment or to garner social media attention to the parents. The point is something cruel done in the name of, joke, of a joke does not protect the child from psychological harm. Here we have a cartoon with baby birds opening their beaks as the parent bird approaches. The parent is saying, gimme, 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 mocking the children for being needy. Baby birds are hardwired to open their beak when a parent approaches the nest. Some emotional expressions and needs are outside of a child's control and our children have need-based hardwired drives for nurturance as well, like crying when they fall down um, or they're scared, which recruits a parent to come and take care of them. So if the parent experiences a child's basic needs as greedy or disgusting or shameful, the child will take that in and come to believe that there's something wrong with him or her. We want to point out that all parents feel overwhelmed by the dependency needs of their children and want to break or feel like I can't stand this incessant neediness anymore. And we don't want in any way to suggest that parenting is easy or that it's not normal to feel overwhelmed and you can't take any more demands. Uh, those are normal feelings. And of course, what we always hope is that parents will be able to identify those feelings in themselves, maybe share it with other frustrated parents, but not take it out on their children. Disney created a lovely movie that made it seem as if scapegoating a child is character building but research shows that in general, children feel terribly demeaned and so, so do coworkers in any group. Humans are very sensitive to be singled out for worse treatment. So it's hard not to take it personally if a child observes their parents being appropriate and loving, nurturing and generous with the other children in the family, but are only harsh and denigrating towards him or her. The next type of PM is terrorizing. These are caregiver behaviors that threaten to uh, or do, hold on a minute, I hurt, got to move my video here, hurt the child or the child's loved ones. Some examples are threatening to abandon, expel, or disown the child. This is a parenting behavior that's really common, and a lot of parents who are really pretty good parents do this because it's so effective. They don't realize that being abandoned by your parents is one of the scariest things that can ever happen to anybody. And so they may say, oh, I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna file a PINS petition. I'm gonna send you to live with some other relative, ex-spouse, whatever. I'm gonna send you to an orphanage. These threats work because kids are totally terrified of this happening. And a lot of parents don't realize how scary that is. Um, allowing the child to witness the parent harming himself or others. Um, and sometimes parents pair this with who are suicidal, may pair that with I'm, I'm killing myself because I can't be a good parent or because you're driving me crazy or whatever. Purposely frightening the child, expecting perfection and rejecting the child for failing to meet uh, the standard of perfection are some other examples. I think this picture speaks for itself. Um, when we get threatened, our body gears up to be beaten. 
um, or to flee if that's a possibility, even if the person doesn't actually carry through on the threat, there's that same reaction, fear reaction to what happened. And it creates this sense of terror and fear within the relationship. Lately, it's become very popular to use a Snapchat filter. This is an example where uh, it looks like a huge tarantula is crawling across a child's face. So parents have been holding up the camera to their baby or young child and using this filter. And then they post the child's terrified response online with humorous comments. Here's another internet example of a parent advising others about how to get your child who's not eating it as you would like to eat when you ask them to. So here's a baby who would not turn the food away, not accept food. So the parents, this parent recommended taking Mickey Mouse, putting them in a high chair, offering food. Baby doesn't, Mickey Mouse doesn't take food, beating Mickey Mouse up, then going to the child, offering food, and the child, totally terrified, takes the food. So again, there's this terrorizing the child in, in order to get a response. The next form is isolating. Um, these are caregiver acts that consistently and reasonably deny the child opportunities to interact with others. These are things like locking a child up in a small space for a long period of time, or even if they're terrified, a small period of time, leaving a child unattended in the crib or playpen for a long period of time, interfering with the child's appropriate friendships, and placing unreasonable restrictions on the child's interactions with other family members. Here's a macaroni joke. And you'll stay in detention until you decide to cheer up and smile. So one way people try to get uh, an improvement in behavior is to put children into extreme timeouts or locking them up, thinking that this is going to be an effective way to uh, improve behavior as opposed to creating an isolated and very discouraged child um, who's not interacting with others, is not developing, um, is not having good relationships with the parent. Jeannie is a true story of a girl who was raised in total isolation. She was raised in near total darkness, also alone in a closet. And this impacted every aspect of her growth and development in a profound and long lasting way. And to hammer the point home here, she was not physically abused or sexually abused and her basic physical needs were met, but she was undeniably harmed. Humans are social creatures and some of the most damaging aspects of like orphanage life are the isolation, the lack of interaction um, that, that children experience. Exploiting and corrupting are caregiver acts that encourage the child to develop inappropriate behaviors and attitudes a very long list here. Uh, this used to be called corrupting the morals of the child. Um, you don't hear that term anymore, but these are having children witness, uh, maybe inviting children to join in or coercing children to participate in antisocial and harmful behavior like prostitution, pornography, criminal activity, substance abuse, violence, and truancy. This is an Indonesian four-year-old who smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. He started when he was 18 months old when his father introduced him to cigarettes. A good way to have a shorter life. Here you have a child being exposed to alcohol. There are other troubling things going on here such as nudity and caretaking of the parent and so forth. This is a very bad scene. There are numerous photos now online of parents dressing their children up as sexy adults and posing them as pole dancers. This is a good example of parents sexualizing their children. 
And of course, it's also encouraged by the advertising industry, which dresses up young children to look sexually knowledgeable and available. Although I've seen less of that lately. This is a still shot from a movie. It's an example of parentification, treating a child like a parent in that the child is being asked to take care of the mother who does not seem to be interested in the child. Of course, you could never make a determination based on a single incident, but this would be very troubling if it were a pattern. Um, and this would constitute corrupting and exploiting the child because the child has to subvert their own needs to be taken care of in order to get any attention from the parent. So the message is that the child is not interesting enough or important enough to warrant the parent's love and approval unless the child is taking care of the parent's needs. This is a really damaging form of psychological maltreatment. It kind of hollows people out um, psychologically. And by young adulthood, they have trouble. They, they either get into relationships where they're completely taking care of another person and denying their own needs, or they are like these kind of monstrously focused on making sure their own needs are met regardless of what it does to anybody else. It's very difficult for them to come to a balanced sense of, of self and other. This kind of solicitous caregiving on the part of the child is something that we actually see with parents who are very poor at parenting, and maybe maltreating in a number of different ways, physically and psychologically. Studies have shown that this type of caregiving can actually improve parenting a little bit um, because the parent is so well taken care of by the kid that they kind of like the kid, even though they don't take care of the kid and it makes them less likely to hit or target that child. And then you get into a situation where this particular child might be much better treated than the other children in the family who maybe bear the brunt of the parents' wrath and whatever. But all of, all of these children are harmed in this type of situation. So this is parentification. Here's an example of what we see as infantilization, bearing in mind that in some cultures, or if this child were disabled, this might be appropriate. But if this were an able-bodied boy who should be running around on his own, and if he was being hauled about by his mother and maybe she was cutting up his food and doing other things that was conveying to him that what's important, I need a baby in my life, so you're gonna be that baby and infantilizing a child and taking away his opportunities to develop normally in an age appropriate way, this would be infantilization. And of course we see other forms in our work. Some parents engage in Munchausen syndrome by proxy, also known as medical child abuse which is where the parent needs to have a sick child to take care of, either to get empathy and concern for other people, um, from other people, maybe to meet their own needs. But the child who is healthy is made to look as if they're sick, sometimes even being somewhat poisoned by, by a parent to get the right effect. But the same thing here is that the parent's needs are kind of sucking the child dry and they're not getting what they need. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, this is, there's a whole literature now on helicopter parents. Um, I've been reading about people who coach parents who did everything for their children and are then hurt when their children want very little to do with them as adults, perhaps because they felt so intruded upon. But the, in the severe forms, this type of parenting is where parents are meeting their own needs by kind of reliving their life the way they wanted to live it by choosing the kid's best friends, picking the music they should like, how they should wear their hair, micromanaging their life so kids don't have their own autonomy, et cetera. Um, the next form, emotional unresponsiveness, are caregiver acts that ignore the child's need and for affection and attention. This is what we, most people would call emotional neglect. So examples, being too busy, bored, depressed, high, or self-involved to respond to um, or pay attention to a child, ignoring a child's pleas for help, not spending regular time with the child, 
rarely of ever saying I love you, hugging, praising, or giving any indication of caring about a child. Ah. So sometimes it's not what we say, but what we do that matters to children. So this parent is aware. Yeah, yeah, I'm listening to you. You want me to pay attention, blah, 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 while walking along which I think is this with a, one of those paddle boards with a ball going up and down. So clearly this woman knows what her son wants and he was able to articulate his needs, but her actions convey that she cannot or will not meet those needs. And you can see how lost um, this little boy needs because his basic needs for attention and affection uh, are being denied. So the final form, medical, mental health, and educational neglect have to do with um, failing to meet a child's needs in these areas. So examples would include not treating a child's badly sw swollen ankle, not taking the child to the hospital after a suicide attempt, and not allowing the child to receive necessary tutoring. Okay, so I've been speaking for a while. What I'd like to do right now is have you, we'll take a little quiz here. I'm going to show three vignettes and I would like you to type into chat if you think they are adequate parenting, might be, or just poor parenting, or if it might be psychological maltreatment. And if you think it might be psychological maltreatment, what form would it be? So here's the first example. Jose's dad attended all of his soccer games. He screamed at Jose whenever he would fail to get into the correct position, fail to hold on to the ball, fail to kick it accurately to a fellow player, etc. You clumsy jerk, you poor excuse for a son, can't you even pass? He would yell from the sidelines. When the game ended, he would be in Jose's face, dressing him down for the quality of his play. Jose hates soccer, but dad won't let him quit. So what do you think? Please type in chat and Sandy will report out, is this adequate parenting? Poor parenting, but not PM. Reason to suspect PM. And if you think it might PM, be PM, what form of the forms we've reviewed? If you can remember them. If you can't use other words. So we have someone who believes that it's reason to suspect. Okay. Burning. Another believes that it is psychological maltreatment. Psychological maltreatment. Looks like that's the uh, prevailing okay. thought that it's letter C. Letter C. Okay, so it's letter C. Any ideas about which form? Maybe people can't remember. We have some votes for spurning. Okay. And terrorizing. Okay. Humiliation. Yep. We would include humiliation, public humiliation under spurning. Spurning. Okay. Great. Yep. Let's go on to the second one. So baby Lewis was fed and changed on a regular schedule, but his mother rarely interacted with him. When she did, she changed him or bathed him without any expression or affection. There was no cuddling, even during feeding, where he was usually propped up in a carrier, little talking and no eye contact. So is this adequate parenting or parenting, but not PM, reason to suspect? And if PM, what form? of C's of reason to suspect. Again, C seems to be the prevailing thought. It's burning. B, we have somebody 
who thinks B and there could be underlying issues with mom. Yeah. C, and some concern about some postpartum. Yeah. C. So one B, but again, prevailing thought was was uh, reason to suspect. Okay. And form? Ignoring, uh, spurning, what some had put in. Okay, so ignoring is another way of saying denying emotional responsiveness is where we would probably put, put this. And yeah, this is something that co-occurs a lot with um, postpartum depression. Um, you also sometimes see it in, you know, some parents are just psychologically unavailable, but sometimes parents in large families just run out of steam um, and maybe there's an unwanted late baby and, and so forth. There's all sorts of circumstances where something like this might happen. Okay, let's do one more. Ah, okay. So after her close friend disclosed that she and Pari, both 10, had been sexually abused by Pari's 19-year-old brother, Arav, CPS ordered mom to bring Pari into a CAC for an evaluation. In front of Pari, mom started the conversation with the forensic investigator by deri deriving the girlfriend as a slut and a disgusting liar who just wanted attention and would do anything to get it. My son would never do that, she insisted emphatically. Pari refused to speak to the forensic interviewer. What do you all see here? <coughs> one looks like it might be a little tougher people I, I can see the the wheels turning for this one here yeah C corrupting also valid safety issues mom is not protecting the child Anybody else want to take a gander here? <clears throat> Sadly, I'm sure some of you who work in this field have probably come across this before. Yeah, you and you feel for parents in this situation. I mean, nobody wants their son to be a sex offender. Um, we, we've set our society up so it's almost impossible to get redeemed from that label once it, it sticks. And so you can see that a parent is, is freaked out and wanting to prevent their child. But at, at the same time here, a choice is being made to go with one child, protect one child and leave the other one unprotected, possibly. Um, and certainly doing everything possible for this, the other child to, to not share the information. And of course, if this guy is a predator, um, you know, that's very problematic, but this, you know, you, this is very common and you feel some empathy for this parent, but you, you also have some, a child that's being sacrificed here. So these are very difficult situations. It's like we had some pretty even B's and C's. Yeah. I, I think it's one that, that people Real, can really see themselves being in that type of situation and struggling with it. We would consider this um, that basically the parent is kind of threatening the daughter to not share information. Um, <clears throat> so we'd, we would see that as, as terrorizing. There's also an element of the Cinderella aspect, which is my son matters, you don't. So no matter what happened to you, I don't want to hear about it because it hurts him. So. Okay, let us move on now to what we want for every child. We wanna send this, end this with something positive. We want all children to look into the eyes of their parent and see themselves reflected back with love. That's our goal. So the takeaways from these sections are, we endorse the heart, Broussard, et cetera, definition of psychological maltreatment, although there are others, they're pretty similar. The definition has six major types, each 
type has subtypes and examples. And the definition identifies the caregiver behaviors, although state statutes tend to focus on the harm to the child. But more and more states like Indiana are actually defining the parental behaviors as well that cause the harm. Okay, now I'd like to talk about risk and protective factors for PM. Although we never blame a child for his or her mal own maltreatment, there are child level characteristics that increase the likelihood of being psychologically maltreated. So we know from research that some ages are more difficult for parents to manage than others. So infants are more at risk of emotional um, neglect and isolation. Middle childhood um, and older teenagers are at risk for spurning and terrorizing more than kids in middle childhood. Kids that are disabled are more likely to be emotionally unresponded to. Kids that have a genetically, influ temperament is very genetically influenced and some people inherit the temp temperament of having more intense emotions, being more difficult to soothe. This, um, in a responsive environment, these kids do really well, but if a parent is stressed and lacks skills, this can complicate things and make them more likely to be targeted. And some children, again, are, you know, aggressiveness is a genetically inherited trait, not completely, but there's a high genetic load. And kids that inherit that are more likely to be mistreated by children or by parents around the world. Caregiver factors, you see these all the time in your work. Parents who maltreat are more likely to be young, have mental health problems, may not know good parenting strategies, may have been maltreated themselves may not be that interested in being a parent. Um, and another interesting thing here, kind of psychological abuse has been more tied than other forms of abuse and neglect to um, inherited characteristics. Some people are born with more irritability, more low impulse control, poor emotional regulation. And if that's the case, they're more likely as a parent to be psychologically aggressive to their children. Risk factors family-wise, too many kids for an adult. Parenting is so emotionally resource taxing that if there are too many kids to the adults, people just don't do as well. You see that when you look at secure attachment, a single child, two thirds likely to have a secure attachment to a parent. Twins, 50%. Triplets, one third are securely attached. I mean, there's a direct ratio. And we know that bigger families get, families that have more than four kids are at risk for, particularly for neglect of different forms. And it's not due to money. It's just people burn out and they don't have the resources. So a lot of family factors have to do with people being under a lot of stress or not having sufficient resources for the task. Community factors. Some communities are really good at supporting families. Mandated reporters look and they report, they take care of kids. And of course there are services offered to parents who are having a hard time. Um, poverty, anything that creates high levels of stress where there isn't an investment in children are risk factors. There are also protective factors. One of the best things for a child is to be born healthy. And this means they have good health, have an easy temperament, learn at a normal rate, have an average age appropriate ability to regulate their emotions and be able to get along with other people. If you have these characteristics, these are protective. And even if you are abused, these help you cope better. Family. Um, you know, it's, it's having competent adults around and enough of them. That, that really make a difference. Um, and these come not only from the family, but also from the, the community. So aunts, grandparents, um, teachers who care. Risk factors are things that stress the family. So having somebody who's developmentally delayed or psychiatrically impaired in the family has a cost. Um, step parents, there's wonderful step parents, but on average, Kids do better when if parents split up, no new people come into the family. Um, 
when you look at risk factors and protective factors, what you're really adding up is a number of them because one or two, even three may not make that much difference. But once you get into four or more, then people's lives kind of go off track. These are all things that help people, families function better. Community, again, same thing. Other people that care about your kids and work hard to create a community that's supportive to raise a family. Um, kids really benefit, for example, from good schools and structured out of school time, like in faith and service groups, sports, music. <clears throat> These can make a real positive difference in children's lives. So the takeaway here is there are many risk factors for PM and there are many protective factors. And generally, these are the same risk and protective factors for other forms of child maltreatment. The one big difference is that a parent is more vulnerable to being psychologically maltreating if they inherit certain characteristics that make them more irritable and less able to regulate their emotions. And children, of course, are more vulnerable if they also inherit characteristics that make them uh, more difficult to raise. Okay, let's talk very briefly about uh, prevalence. Um, there's two types of information on how commonly things occur. This is true for PM and other forms of abuse and neglect. If you just look at what actually gets called into the police or child protective services, screened in, investigated and substantiated, you come up with really tiny numbers. However, if you look at self-reports, either what's going on currently by asking kids or teenagers or adults looking back, you get very high reports, particularly for psychological maltreatment. So what's going on? Basically, informant reports are more likely to be very severe cases. Um, and so it's not surprising that there's few of them. Psychological maltreatment is totally underreported because six states don't even have it in their law. Um, but self-reports can be overestimates. So we think the best estimates combining both types of data is that between 10 and 30% of community samples have experienced moderate levels of PM in childhood and 10 to 15% more severe or chronic forms. So Amy Baker and I did a study in 2013 of youth in foster care who were interviewed by their therapist and 24% reported some PM by a foster parent. And this probably wouldn't be that far off if you did like a community sample for kids as well. And you have to bear in mind, foster parents are dealing with much tougher kids than your average kid in a family. Two thirds reported PM by a birth parent and almost 78% by um, one or the other. So the takeaways here is that PM is widespread. Self-reports have higher rates than informant reports. PM is experienced by high-risk populations such as children uh, in foster care, probably because they were originally maltreated. And then of course, they get more difficult to raise because of all the trauma that they have been through. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about the harm caused by psychological maltreatment. In the US, sexual abuse is consistently defined, always illegal, and is a felony investigated by the police. Physical abuse is consistently defined illegal and addressed by child protective services in all states. And if it's really severe, it could then get bumped up to the police, certainly if you kill your child. Neglect is variously defined in state statutes and often uh, addressed by CPS when it's reported, although it tends to be the least reported by mandated reporters. PM is variously defined. It's not in six state statutes and many other states, even though it's in their statutes, don't report it. It's often screened out if reported and few intervention programs address it. Does research support this ranking of forms as to seriousness? No, it doesn't. Research shows that PM is as harmful and in some case worse than other forms of child maltreatment. And this literature is based on uh, studies that have been done around the world. When I first started 
researching child or psychological abuse back in the 1980s, there were just a few studies from like the 1970s that had been done. And now the, the research literature comes in from all over the world, including some countries that didn't have, that were poor and didn't have a research base in the past. And we know from this literature that it consistently ties these forms of PM caregiver behavior with current and future harm to children. So some of the evidence of harm caused by PM is from the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that many of you have heard of. Um, back in the 1990s, CDC teamed up with Kaiser Permanente to document the long-term effects of negative childhood events. And they enrolled 7,000 individuals who reported on seven negative events, which included spurning and terrorizing, which th these are the two items on the screen here that were listed. And they also looked at witnessing mother battering, which we would consider terrorizing, as well as divorce, household member with mental illness, alcoholism, or incarceration. Um, many of the papers written about the ACE data have demonstrated that all of the ACEs and, are, and especially PM have strong and consistent associations with poor outcomes that include obesity, drug abuse, diabetes, et cetera. And here's a widely used uh, slide showing how early adversity from these different adverse events are related to lifelong outcomes like more traumatic brain injury, fractures, burns, getting pregnant when you don't want to, HIV, STDs, cancer, diabetes, low education, occupation outcome, depression, anxiety, and suicide. So what we've learned from the ACE and a lot of other studies done around the world, including studies where children have been followed from birth very closely and all, all their records have been attained, is that all forms of child maltreatment are associated with bad outcomes for children, including psychiatric conditions. So child maltreatment is estimated to account for 59% of all depression and anxiety conditions worldwide. Some researchers think there are no unique effects. All forms of maltreatment are equally harmful um, and we, shouldn't, we should just assess all forms and just decide whether someone's being maltreated or not. But there are quite a few studies that show uniquely different effects for say psychological abuse, psychological neglect, or like sexual abuse. So what are these unique effects for PM? There are five major categories where there are uniquely stronger effects for PM than for other forms. Not that these other forms are not related to these outcomes, but they are particularly related to psychological abuse or neglect. Type one, depression and suicidality. The link between PM and depression is really strong. The ACEs study found that childhood emotional abuse posed the greatest risk of the ACEs for both a lifetime history of depressive disorders and recent depressive disorders. In teenagers, it's strongly linked to treatment resistant depression. There's also a very long link with suicide, large link with suicidality, which is more strongly linked to psychological abuse and neglect than it is uh, to other forms in many studies that have been done around the world. So here's a clinical example that you might see in your work. Lena, age five, is the result of an unplanned pregnancy. She was the recipient of her mother's verbal outbursts. Her parents' marriage had been strained for many years and the attention required by Lena infuriated her mother. As the parents near divorce, the mother's verbal assaults intensified and they included screaming that Lena was the cause of marital problems, that if she had not caused so much trouble, her parents would be happy and that she should have been aborted. Lena stopped playing with other children in kindergarten. She was repeatedly observed by her teacher to enact the death of a baby doll saying, everything would be fine if you were never born. Harm type two is conduct disorders. And this is strongly linked to kids that are both psychologically abused and physically abused. So this is very hot hostility coming with hands and 
words at kids. Um, so it, it's related to dramatically increased um, likelihood. And of course, conduct disorders are also influenced a bit by genetics, but there's a very strong environmental component here. And then related to this, substance abuse and co-occurring depression and anxiety are specifically tied to psychological abuse, and so is sexually risky behavior. Here's a clinical example you might find in your work. At age two, Sonny was accused by his mother of physically abusing his passive five-year-old older brother when CPS came to investigate his brother's bruises. The worker observed mother encouraging Sonny's bullying and hitting his older brother. And she observed her threats to break Sonny's finger. She also observed her harsh denial of his bid for affection when he tried to crawl into her lap. She screamed at him, don't be a baby and pushed him aside. Sonny's play was disorganized and destructive. It consisted of banging and throwing toys in a frenzied fashion. And all of the human and animal figures had missing limbs and heads. He was already an early intervention for emotional and behavioral disturbance. Harm type three is thinking problems. This surprises people because things like dissociation, hallucination, getting diagnosed as having a psychotic disorder because you see or hear things that aren't there, for example, has been specifically tied to psychological abuse, including verbal abuse, which we would call spurning and witnessing domestic violence. Many experts consider this, these reactions part of the trauma response to maltreatment. So here's a clinical example, which many of you who, you know, if you work in like a group home or something, you may well have, have seen uh, this child is still in the home. Bernard's parents screamed, threatened to hit and kill, threw things at each other and pulled knives out on occasion. His older brother was constantly called names and yelled at, and sometimes Bernard too. Home felt very scary, and Bernard, age 12, stayed away as much as possible. At night, he had trouble sleeping and had nightmares. During the day, he kept hearing someone angrily calling his name when no one else was around, and a voice in his head told him how bad, crazy, and worthless he was. He wondered if he was losing his mind. And sometimes kids with this profile start using alcohol or other drugs to just quiet the voices and calm themselves down. Harm type four, psychological neglect is related to significant declines in functioning in early life. Um, one of the most important studies here is the Minnesota Longitudinal Study of Risk and Adaptation, where they, this started in the 1970s and now they're, they're into the grandchildren. But they took uh, very low income mothers that had used public services to have their first child and have been following them. And they identified a lot of these women, even though they were poor, did a great job parenting, but there was a group that was much more at risk. And one form of maltreatment they identified, which tends to not get reported, was mothers who were emotionally unavailable, psychologically unavailable to their child. Um, so they provided good physical care, but they didn't interact much at all with their child. And they found that on an infant IQ test, these kids were average at 12 months, but they were already well below average at 18 months. There's also a whole host of studies from around the world, longitudinal studies that have started at birth that have found a strong relationship with psychological neglect, sometimes with co-occurring physical neglect and low cognitive functioning. So an example of this is the 1958 British birth cohort of 9,000. And they found that psychological and physical neglect in childhood significantly predicted really low math and reading scores as a kid, low educational qualifications. They didn't go very far in school by age 42 and already by 50 memory and processing speed problems. So this wasn't psychological abuse or other forms of maltreatment. This is psychological neglect, sometimes co-occurring with physical neglect, sometimes by itself. And this is an example of baby Jose. I had you comment on that. Um, 
So here he was fed, there was little eye contact, but this is exactly the type of child that looks normal by 12 months, by 18 months, they've lacked that social and cognitive stimulation you get from interacting closely with a parent and other family members, already well below an average in language and social responsiveness, easily frustrated and inattentive, didn't cooperate with adults, and already in need of early intervention services. This is like a fast track into early childhood special ed, and of course, a, a life where you end up being that part of the population that sucks up a ton of support services because you're not able to function as a competent adult. The fifth type is uh, really interesting because some of the problems are striking. My favorite is hearing impairments. So Japan has the Japan Environment and Children's Study where they have from across the nation, 80,000 mother infant pairs that they picked up prenatally and are following through their life. And they wanna find out what factors influence child development. So they control for like 16 things that might affect hearing loss, like uh, noisy environment, smoking during pregnancy. And what they found is mothers who were verbally abused by their partner, but not physically abused, failed two hearing screenings right after birth and had to be then referred for a full audiological evaluation because of suspected hearing loss. And they had various theories that maybe hearing, having your mother all agitated while hearing angry voices somehow interfered with the development of the auditory system in utero, um, but it was a very interesting finding. Most people who follow the research in this area know there's a strong relationship between asthma um, and psychological abuse, but most of us don't know that psychological plus physical abuse is related to being shorter. Okay, so the five takeaways from this section is that there is a huge international research literature that's high quality and shows a causal relationship between PM forms of parenting and negative outcomes. There are five more domains of uniquely greater harm. PM is associated with um, numerous negative outcomes for children in the short term and over the course of the life. It's an adverse childhood experience and it's not treated as seriously as it should be. Okay. Let's switch now to intervention because it's my understanding that's what most of you do. It's good to identify poor parenting that might be psychological maltreatment or psychological maltreatment and know when we need to report and know when, if we're not sure what we can do in the moment, but always trying to find ways to support families. The best way to do this is to be able to engage positively. What we're proposing, and this isn't new to us, but the term upstander, which means a mobilized bystander. This is somebody who does not walk away when they see parents engaging in parenting that may be harmful, but they also don't degrade or punish or take a superior, I know better position, which is definitely not gonna be successful. So an upstander recognizes a need, reflects on options, chooses to engage in a respectful, sensitive manner, tries to find a way to communicate understanding, empathy, and caring, focuses on everybody's needs, emphasizes assets, strengths, and possibilities, and helps de-escalate negative emotions, provides encouraging perspective, and if there's time, guidance. Okay, upstander, mobilized bystander. All right, so what's important is to think about what you might do. So this is, I've heard a lot of you were early intervention with early childhood, so I have a lot of those examples, but what have you done, what might you do? If you're at a childcare center, you're a staff member and you observe a mother who's in a rush to remove the boots and jacket from a crying, fussing 14 month old son who says in a loud, angry voice, stop acting like a baby. You are a big boy, so stop being a crybaby. If you don't stop right now, I'm going to lose my job. Okay, probably many of us have been there, right? So an upstander approach here would be, here's some ideas. You guys may have better ones. 
But what's going on here is the mom does need to leave. And the mom may benefit from concrete help like getting the child's boots and jacket off. But there can also be comments that, that might help calm the parent down. You're trying so hard to keep your job and be on time and you must feel frustrated and anxious that your baby is making it hard for you to leave. Okay, so that's empathizing. The parent may be having this experience but also feel kind of humiliated themselves, other people watching and they're basically melting down. Okay, so parents can feel not, can not only behave in ways that are conveying a lot of hostility and disapproval to their child but they also are aware that they look bad and they feel bad. To mom about the baby, he must love his time with you and it has to be hard separating, especially on a stressful morning. Crying is how he tells you he doesn't want you to leave. But once he gets settled down, he'll have a good time. I'm sure if you guys work in early childhood, you've got a ton of these kind of memorized, but it's illustrating the point. And to the baby, it's hard to say bye-bye to mom, but you're gonna have lots of fun today. When she comes back, you can tell her about the fun, the train you played with and on the swing. So kind of moving in in a supportive way, normalizing the emotions of both the mom and the baby, providing some practical help and also some reassurance. Okay. Now, a key skill here in being able to uh, engage is to be able to use stuff, soft startups that are kind of constructive um, and don't put the person down. So when we're upset and we have something important to communicate, it's really easy sometimes to be harsh. Maybe we're upset. Maybe we feel poorly treated. It's very easy to move in. You always do thus and such. I just can't stand thus and such, whatever in harsh way, don't treat your kid like that, you know, whatever, things that will just make things worse. The problem with harsh startups, even though they convey uh, an honest emotion and maybe something that needs to be communicated and discussed, they almost doom the likelihood that the person uttering the harsh startup is gonna get what they want. So a key skill is learning to take the message from and that you're thinking about that may be worded very harshly and to find a way to deliver it in a way that is empathetic and positive and uh, improves the situation. Because when you think about it, harsh startups are often veiled psychologically aggressive messages that are disrespectful, destructive, criticizing, rejecting, whatever. So here are some examples. You never do anything right, you are stupid. Stop doing that, it won't work. You're just like your father which is particularly bad if you don't have conveyed you don't like the father. Go ask somebody else to help you. I've got more important things to do. I'll give you something to cry about if you keep whimpering. So when you think about that, if you were the receiver of these communications, would you respond positively? If you go to somebody who says, I've got more important things to do, would you be inclined to go back to them again? If somebody threatens you, are you going to expect are you going to share legitimate concerns you might have? Um, you know, if you're going to be criticized, does that make you feel warm and friendly to the other person? Probably not. Probably not. So we can think of these from our partners, from work staff, from a boss. Um, but also these are important in terms of how we communicate with parents. So what we want to do here is just a few exercises to give you practice. We want to be able to take a harsh startup and replace it with a soft startup. So here's an example of a child and family service caseworker to the parent. How can I trust you? You never follow through when you say you will. Okay, that's a very legitimate thing. We've all worked with people who are supposed to be and maybe say they are legitimately involved in the work we're doing together, and yet they never come through. And this makes us angry. Why are we wasting our time, et cetera? Okay, so it's a legitimate feeling that the person has, but there might be better ways than telling someone they're untrustworthy. 
uh, to deal with this situation. So a softer way to do it would believe I both, I believe we both want the same good things for your family and child, but when we come up with a plan, then something happens, so the plan falls apart. Can we talk about what we can do to make our plans work? Okay, you can think up all sorts of things here. The thing is to take all hint of criticism to keep the message, right? The message here is we come up with something and it doesn't work. So I'm really not sure what's going on here. And you know, you're probably getting frustrated, but you need an opening to talk about this that doesn't put the other person down. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. What I'd like you to do in chat is to, for each of these, or maybe you only have time to do one each, but if some of you could do, take parent to child, stop doing that, it won't work, you're just like your father, and turn that into a more positive message. Intimate partner, you just wanna work all the time and never be home with us. You know, again, legitimate concern, can that be rephrased? And then child service personnel to parent, you're not holding your child right, you're making her cry. Is there a way to make these less critical? So please type those in on chat and Sandy will report out what you came up with. Okay, one suggestion. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you stop yelling, please, and use your inside voice? I will listen when you're calm. Mm. Okay. I think we need to look at another way that you can do that. Maybe for the third one. Okay. Although a couple of these <laughs> could um, be used in, in more than one than yet. I'm sure we wanted to tell an adult to use their inside voice before too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I guess you can say things a bit. It's hard to listen when you're yelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I really want to hear what you have to say, but it's hard to listen when you're yelling. Uh, why are you doing that? Is something bothering you? We miss you at home while you are at work. Oh, that's a nice one. That is a nice one. Okay, in the interest of time, those are very good. So in the interest of time, I also came up with some. And I think these reflect what people said. So parent to child, stop doing that. Let me show you another way that might get you what you want. You work all the time. We really miss being with you. Can we talk about our schedules? I like the one that the person attending had the same message. We miss you. That's, that's really the message, the positive message. Um, and you never know, you may think the person wants to work all the time, but you know, like if you're just had a new baby and one person may be making all the money for the family, they may be working because they're scared and worried there won't be, you know, you don't know. It's good to have a conversation. And then the child caregiver, the child seems to be upset. Why do you think that is? And I think we had a participant who gave a nice example there too. So these are all more positive ways to begin the conversation. Okay, so I, Sandy, I think we may only be able to do one um, of these in the interest of time, but what I wanna do is present a vignette and think about what could you, should you, would you do and should you involve any others and if so, how? So. Here we are again, since we've, we've got three examples here of, of situations where kids aren't doing very well and very little and not getting a lot of attention. So this is Kathy and her mom. Your next door neighbor, Ruth, has a 10 month old girl, Kathy, and she likes you and trusts you as a friend. You've gone shopping together, gossip, shared likes, dislikes, concerns, previously, but not lately. 
You've noticed that Ruth has not been going out of the house much, connects with you less and seems depressed. Kathy is almost always combined to a crib or playpen with little attention or interest shown by Ruth, even when Kathy's crying extensively. But Kathy's fed regularly, clothed properly. Kathy seems listless, inactive, too small for her age, too thin, and she's looking pasty. You're concerned. You've gone to Ruth's door and she's invited you in for coffee in a room where Kathy is turned to the wall, sits in the corner of a playpen. What might you do or say to help as an upstander? Apply your upstander and soft start scales. We'll give people a few minutes. If you'd please type in ideas you have in chat. We have any responses? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> They're thinking hard. Okay. So Christina says maybe start interacting with the child and watch Ruth's interaction. That might open the door to discuss any concerns she's having. Good okay, good. Yeah. Offer to take the baby um, to give Ruth the opportunity to get out for a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the empathy, let her know I, you know, how I understand how difficult, difficult it is to care for a baby. I'd like to offer help so she can take a nap or just some time for herself. Great examples. Yes. I feel somebody saying to uh, Ruth, I feel like something has changed with you. I don't see or talk to you as much as in the past. What has been happening? I really like that one because this, she really may be quite depressed. And we, we know from our clinical work and from research, this is a really dangerous situation here. If she is too depressed to care for her baby, which is what it looks like. And interventions can be very effective in turning things around, but the, the baby's having a very hard time. This is a very active time for brain development. So I like all those suggestions. I particularly like bringing up what is the problem because sometimes people don't feel comfortable talking about being depressed, but you know, she could feel depressed, she could feel suicidal, she could feel she's not up to being a parent, she could just be despondent and really wanting care. So I think opening the door that way would be very effective. And then all the other practical suggestions I think are as excellent as well. Just in the interest of time, um, I think this is a situation too, that if those efforts didn't work, it would be really important maybe to bring in other family members. And if that wasn't helpful to call Child Protective Services, because this, this could completely damage um, Kathy's long-term development with this degree of neglect and lost interaction and so forth. Okay. Well, we had several, two other examples, but um, Sandy warned me, but I, I time things and things always take a little bit longer. So we won't talk about coach Garcia, who's gone from being a great coach to very critical or the teacher who's scapegoating the child. But I think the same general principles apply. So what I wanna talk about right now in the last section is how you could change your social environment to prevent psychological maltreatment and, uh, and improve and opportunities for respect for everybody. 
So I'm gonna first talk about how to enforce psychological and physical safety in the environment you control. These could be your waiting room, this could be your facility, your classroom, your daycare center, um, if you run a group home, any setting like that. And then how to create a climate of support for parents and children. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the no hit zone movement that's kind of spreading across the country. Um, it's a very promising practice to re change cultural and social norms around hitting children, i.e. spanking or worse. And no hit zones are, address a key risk factor for child maltreatment, which is when parents use physical discipline, they not only end up hitting kids, but they often end up psychologically abusing them as well by calling them names. But this form of, of physical punishment is very popular around the US and people mistakenly believe that it is in the Bible. Even though there's a very, it's not in the Bible and there's a very large literature indicating negative outcomes and no positive outcomes. That's I think also very important. So it's associated with significantly more aggression and antisocial behavior. When parents hit kids, they're modeling hitting as an approach to solving conflicts. Uh, it's associated with more mental health problems. Kids feel bad about themselves and it can make them angry and anxious. Uh, it makes kids not like their parents, associated with lower self-esteem, academic performance. And there's one study that has shown a negative impact on the brain from getting regular physical punishment. So the purpose of a no-hit zone is to create an environment of comfort and safety for families. Um, so the policy is no adult shall hit another adult, no adult shall hit a child, no child shall hit an adult, and no child shall hit another child. And you can use signage if you join this group. They have a ton of things that are already developed. I'll show you some posters. Um, and they provide already developed training for the staff. So they'll understand how to intervene when hitting is occurring, but not place themselves in danger. Um, <clears throat> so they're taught to identify and respond to situations that are compromising the safe environment. Do it in a non-judgmental way that empathizes with the frustration and stress individuals may be experiencing, like if they're sitting in a waiting room. Reminding parents that this is a no-hit zone, not making threats, uh, some hospitals, one of our hospitals here, plastered all over the hospital, every elevator door, everywhere says, you know, we will not tolerate verbal or physical aggression. If we see this, we will call the police. Their approach is not so threatening, although if indicated, security or child protective services could be called. And then you thank individuals for respecting the policy. So we have been working with um, the no hit zone group because physical punishment frequently co with PM, because both are ineform ineffective forms of discipline, because both are big risk factors for child abuse, because parents who hit and yell often do it because they believe it's effective and because they really don't know what else to do. They may not know positive parenting tactics. So we think changing social norms around physical punishment and PM through education and advocacy is an important way to help parents rear their children without violence. Of course, if you're taking away tools parents have, you also need to offer positive parenting, painless parenting, various approaches to parenting so parents will know what to do. So for a conference that we put on, a little over a month ago, Mari Wernham, who is from UNICEF and an Indiana a teenager, 16 year old, Dalioana, who is involved in uh, children's services, analyzed the existing no hit zone posters. Here are some examples here to see how they might be modified to include uh, no yelling. And this is what they came up with. They thought a central sticker could be used flexibly 
And it could be adding things like no hits with hands or words. And here are the stickers that they came up with. They thought they could be put on stickers, decals, doors, hand out to children, part of wider posters, no hit zone, no hitting with hands or words, different colors. They could have the logo of the organization, uh, like Prevent Child Abuse America, for example, or the villages. Here are two posters they came up with. Um, See things differently, proud to be a no hit zone for child to adult, adult to child, no hitting with hands or words, it's the Indiana way and whatever logo of the group. And this is another example. Um, and again, these are available on, on our website, but we really encourage you to look into the no hit zone and become a certified no hit zone and to incorporate in your hit zone, uh, no hitting with hands or words. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is there's a very small but growing research on what parents need. Some of this came from uh, research on, you know, about kids, parents yelling and hitting kids in grocery stores, which upsets people or shopping malls and, and so forth. And so they interviewed people who had watched this and it intervened and what went well, what didn't go well, um, had chosen not to intervene and how they felt about it parents who had had people say something to them and those who hadn't, what parents would like and so forth. So from this literature, we found that parents hate grocery shopping with hungry children. They would like a room in a grocery store where they could chill out if their kid's getting dysregulated. They of course want no candy or other foods near the checkout stand. But they would also like signage and messages over the broad speaker that said, very hard for parents to shop with children at the end of the day. If you see a child or parent that are having difficulties, ask if you can help, ask if you can pick up a product for them. So kind of normalizing it. So it's not like something wrong with me, I can't manage my kid, but that everybody has trouble shopping with kids and move in and help. So they wanted something along those lines. Um, the other thing that came up is there are situations where parents typically misbehave besides grocery stores, for example, getting shots. So one common pattern is for parents to freak out and abandon their child, even their little two-year-old, just bolting and leaving the nurse to handle it because it so freaks them out. So their child feeling under threat is left with a scary individual they don't know and they're getting a very painful procedure. This freaks children out. Other parents are embarrassed when their kid cries and fusses, so they call them names and make threats. So putting up public service announcements about how getting shots is hard for both parents and kids and how what we found works, even though it's difficult, is the parent just to hold the child close and say, no, this is gonna hurt a little bit, but we'll be, go through this together, you know, et cetera. These are things that could be run on a loop on a video in the doctor's office. But I think all of you in your settings can think about times that are difficult. Uh, maybe if a lot of you are foster parents, if kids are, um, you know, issues between foster parents when kids leave to go visit their birth home or come back, all sorts of situations. I think you could think about what would promote the best parenting and support kids and make everybody feel as safe as possible in these predictable sorts of situations. So that's the material that I have uh, today. I wanna thank you for your participation and for caring about children and all the work you do in your professional and personal life on their behalf. And I would like to answer any questions you may have. You can either put it in the chat or um, I'm looking at the Q&A part two, whatever is easiest for anyone who might have a question. know it's a lot to it's a lot to digest yeah. <laughs> it is mm. nothing so far you did a great job marla oh we have one question 
Uh, can you point to any resources or speak about child psychological maltreatment as regards to parents refusing to acknowledge a child's gender identity? Thank you, Donna. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, I can't offhand. I'm willing to look for some. I think this is a really developing area. I know in, in school psychology, our newsletters and the listserv and so forth are filled with um, concerns along these lines. Um, and I, I think a lot of this is kind of developing. So I don't know, but that's, that's a good question. I'll see if I can look something up and see if I can find something. But I, I mean, you hear personal stories all the time of how painful for that is for children's sexual orientation, sexual identification, you know, et cetera, to not be acknowledged. Um, you know, it's very difficult, but I, I don't have a resource at the moment, but I'll look for one. Thank you for your question. Yes, and, and Marla, if you get that to us, we'll make sure and yeah. uh, get it to everybody or, you know, post it ourselves because it is a very important topic. And just as an aside, um, you know, children who are residing in foster care, uh, it's believed that over 30% identify as LGBTQ+. Plus. Yeah. Um, and about 5%, you know, as transgender. So that's another area, you know, within our child welfare system that we really we need extra support and training um, around. And of course, these children sadly are, are more at risk for uh, suicidal ideations, uh, homelessness, um, sexual, ex ex sexual exploitation. So we absolutely need to do better about that. Um, I Megan that, asks- I think the field is definitely, I mean, the level of professional training for, you know, for people has really grown and so forth. Um, yeah, they're disproportionately in the throwaway kid yeah. arena. And uh, I, I feel like so much progress has been made in, in that particular area, but um, it's been mostly made, I think, with adults and in certain communities. And th there's still so much work that needs to be done there because kids are definitely getting rejected and pushed out of their homes. So um, there's a question. Uh, why do you think psychological maltreatment is so rarely investigated and substantiated by Child Protective Services and how can we change that? Gee, that's something we've been thinking about, huh, Marla? Yeah, I, I think there's several issues here and actually, Sandy, you, you can jump in here. I, I think one of them is uh, the lack of agreed upon standards. And I think we're finally at a point where we have a definition that's been tried out like with the whole US military use a common definition and their definition of psychological maltreatment requires demonstrable harm. We would prefer, me, my colleagues and I, to intervene before kids get harmed, but it's very clear you cannot get uh, professionals to reliably identify psychological maltreatment unless harm is assessed. Now, that doesn't need to be super complicated. I've worked with states saying, well, we can identify harm once kids get into the public schools because they have a social worker, they have a school psychologist, they have a counselor, and they can testify that a kid has severe anxiety, behavior problems, and so forth that we can tie to the parental behavior. Um, but a, a lot of the kids we see have very clear records that can be used to, to establish harm. And I think it's very clear that when you see parental behavior and you're not so sure how severe it is because you're getting a snapshot, the harm tells you how severe it is. So if you see a snapshot, but the kid is doing great, then you're thinking maybe this is just in the moment. Maybe it's a concern. You want to intervene and say that can be helpful because you're not seeing evidence that the child has been harmed. But when you have severe fear reactions, you have a baby uh, modeling, engaging in, uh, you know, I should never been born suicidal thinking as a kindergartner, getting thought disorders, um, behavior problems, functioning well below their intellectual level in school, unable to attend, you know, et cetera. These are fear, clearly fear, clear signs when you can rule out other possibilities that something's seriously wrong. So you match that up with the caregiver behavior and you have the harm you can substantiate. I think that is at this point is a matter of training. Um, but I do think that people feel overwhelmed. Most departments of social services feel overwhelmed. Um, I was talking to Indiana social service people 
they've gotten very publicly punished and this is not unique to Indiana for maybe overly identifying people and you get pushback. So then you're in the papers and your agency's humiliated for over identifying people. Um, so I, I think Child Protective Services then wants to become super conservative and you need to like be an immediate threat of being raped or having broken bones or something. So we, we have this tension uh, that goes back and forth because we often under support child protective services and then we punish them if they don't. It's a it's a very psychologically abusive situation that that child protective services are in. They're abused and neglected by by state agencies. But I think the I think we do have the research reliable definitions that have been tested out through the whole U.S. military. And if we have this clear harm piece and get people trained up, um, and if if states are willing then to accept those cases and we're able then to provide intervention and support for families, I think that could turn the corner on this form of abuse and neglect. But again, we, we have to bear in mind, we're trying to stop people from doing something, but we don't necessarily support them in doing, doing something else. So I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common problem, but I think right now it's a matter of clear definition and changing social norms. Sandy, did you wanna add anything else? It, no, and, and Megan kind of alluded to that by changing the way it, so it's not so punishing to parents who yeah. may be struggling and, you know, living with mental health issues or exhaustion. So yes, if, if we have to show harm because we need to protect the child, of course, but we want there to be that, that replacement for parents and, and, you know, understand what is going on with them as well. And Christine asked a question. Um, as a mandated report, and by the way, I, I'm sure everybody on, on here knows this, but in Indiana, you know, every person, every adult is, is considered a mandated mm. re reporter. Is That's it better good. to make a referral for a counselor versus CPS? Um, it, it may not be an either or, uh, because as the law states, you know, if you have, re if, if you have reason to believe that a child is a victim of child abuse or neglect, you must make a report. So it doesn't mean you you can't, you know, refer to a counselor, but if you believe a child is experiencing harm, then, then of course you, you have to make that report. And hopefully, you know, between the, the two agencies, um, you know, can help and, and support can, can be provided. I, I completely agree with that. Um, I, I've seen a lot of parents who treated it as a wake-up call and made changes that they would not have made um, if there wasn't that publicly drawing the line. This is not okay. You cannot treat your child this way. And I think for the children too, it's a message that other people care about them. Why didn't anybody say something? Doesn't anybody care about me? Um, that it can be very validating that someone else said this wasn't okay. I don't deserve to be treated this way. Anything else? We've got some thank yous to you. Thank you for listening. And uh, we have our last um, uh, presentation um, next Friday on uh, equity and diversity and inclusion. So we hope that you all can, can join us then. And then actually, on June 29th, we're doing uh, another child psychological maltreatment sort of 101 lunch and learn. Um, as you can tell, Indiana, with the help of, of Marla and, and Stuart Hart, we're really trying to uh, you know, make some additional inroads on this on this issue. So I'm going to stop recording.